Philippians chapter 4. We're going to read from where we left off last week, which we were dealing with verses 8 and 9. So we'll read from verse 10. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done, that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And amen indeed. May the Lord bless his word to us here this morning. Give us light in understanding. Let's just still our hearts briefly again for prayer. Every one of us, depending upon the Lord, we need him to open up the word to us. Lord, we're thankful that those of us who have been on the road at least, anyway, any length of time, we have learned that thou wilt take care of us. We have no charge to bring against thee of thy negligence. And we pray our hearts will never get to the point where we will lay such a charge at thy feet. We pray for what is instructed here in this passage, to be content, to understand contentment, to experience contentment. Lord, we pray that thy word will come with sharp power to our hearts that what we learn today will not be forgotten easily. We pray for the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I, I just can't do the work. I can't get the word into hearts. I can't cause people to hear. I can't cause anyone to obey. Even myself, Lord, I stand in need. Speak to me. Speak to all. Minister powerfully in salvation and sanctifying grace upon the hearts of of thy people. Exalt Christ in all that is said and done. Let us leave here this morning knowing that thou hast drawn near. Our hearts have been touched. We've seen Christ and our souls are thrilled with thy word. So make us love thy word now. Love it more as we hear it. And may thy name be glorified as we obey it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to this closing portion of this letter. We approach no doubt what was one of the primary reasons for the apostle taking up his pen in the first place. That reason being to say thank you. Thank you to those who practically reached out to him. Thank you to those who observed that they perhaps in some way could contribute to lessening the suffering of the great apostle Paul. Having heard that he was imprisoned there in Rome, they understood that in some way perhaps they could help him. He could no longer make tents. He could no longer provide for his own needs by his own hands. And was anyone else taking care of him? Was anyone else looking out for him? Perhaps they were not aware. And so they send a man with a gift to supply the need of the Apostle Paul. He, of course, has made passing reference to their giving in chapter 2. Verse 25 says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, that is, sending him back, and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants, he that brought 
uh, the needs to me and minister to me by his own presence. Verse 30, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me, your lack of giving, the fact that you hadn't given up until this point in a long time, he has supplied it. So he has made passing reference to it, but like any gentleman, he wants to be specific about his gratitude. He wants to say thank you. And of course, the whole purpose of the letter does, is not just about saying thank you, so he doesn't begin with a thank you, but he has much to teach them, much to instruct them, much that he has heard they need instruction in. And so he leaves it to the very end, because while it was important, there were other things more important. In these verses, we're not given a simple thank you, but valuable teaching on the whole concept of giving, receiving, and a proper perspective of material things. It's not the only passage that reveals these things, but it certainly is an instructive one. And what we're considering here this morning, as time is running on, get into this, the meat of this text now, we're considering the joy of Christian giving. The joy of Christian giving. And I know I speak to a people who already know that joy. I know you've experienced it and you practice it every Lord's Day. But let us look at what the text can instruct us in. And may God help us. First of all, we note here Paul's declaration of joy in their gift. His declaration of joy in their gift. You see that in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were all so careful, but ye lacked opportunity. After having given much instruction concerning the Christian's need to rejoice in the Lord, no matter what, Paul gives another example of himself finding joy in the midst of his own imprisonment. He has already spoken of that joy right in chapter 1. Whenever he talked about from verse 12, that he wanted them to understand that everything that had occurred to him had fallen out rather onto the furtherance of the gospel, and there are those who are rising up to preach the gospel. However, in those rising up to preach the gospel, there are those who are for him and those who are against him, some preaching uh, with envy and strife and others of goodwill. And he says then in verse 18, What then, notwithstanding, in spite of all this, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So I'm rejoicing. He lets them know I'm rejoicing in prison. I'm rejoicing over the fact that my imprisonment has caused there to be a rising of preaching within the city. There are some who don't like me. There are some who do like me. But I'm not too concerned about that. Christ is being preached and I rejoice in that. So I'm rejoicing in how my imprisonment has actually led to the furtherance of the gospel. So he's spoken of this joy in spite of his present house arrest. But now he speaks of another matter which brought him great joy when he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. That is, I was made to rejoice. Has the idea of being passive and this being done to him. Something came into his life that caused him to rejoice in the Lord. He declares here, first of all, the source of his joy. When he says that now at the last, your care of me hath flourished again. This sums up the reason why he's rejoicing. The source of his joy, the fact that his, their care, their concern, their provision has flourished again. Now he uses in this little phrase a very rare term in the Greek when we have it translated hath flourished again. The idea is here to shoot up, sprout again, grow green again, or flourish again. It's the idea, it's only used here in the New Testament and is very rare, it seems, by the scholars I read, read in the Greek in general, really only being used in poetry or being found in some Greek poetry. The idea is that of a manifestation of life after the appearance of death. It's what we see every year in spring when there are those trees and those bushes that have all the appearance of death and we may look at them and wonder, did the frost get them? Are they really dead or are they dying? Have they been destroyed of their ability to blossom and bring forth fruit? And then we find out in the spring that they have survived. And they are ready to bring forth their blossoms and their fruit uh, with the change of weather and climate. Well, that's the idea that has brought out this hath flourished again. 
I'm seeing after such a long time proof that the tree that was planted there in Philippi has not stopped bearing fruit. I haven't seen it physically. I've had no personal witness of the fruit that's being born there at Philippi. But after some decade or so, as we believe the time has passed since he was there at Philippi, after about a decade, I am now observing again the flourishing of your spiritual blossoms and fruit. This is the source of his joy. The reason for his joy, a blossoming of life which is how he interprets their giving. Their giving to him was proof of spiritual life. In the years that had passed since he had left them, he had not witnessed any tangible fruit, but here he sees it. Verse 15 and 16 elaborates more on their provision in the past. Ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, that is when I was first there, Acts 16 this brings us to, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Then he takes us into the record of what we have in Acts 17, him being in Thessalonica. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. When I left you, you didn't forget about me. You sent provision for me. And having done that, they were the type of church who wanted to help in whatever way they could practically as Paul had departed from them. But years had now passed and he had never heard from them with regard uh, to this capacity anyway of giving. So he declares the source of his joy, the fact that they have given, that they have come to bear fruit again right before his very eyes and that thrills his heart. So there we have him declaring the source of his joy. He also declares the sphere of his joy because he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Not just I rejoiced greatly. We might say that. He may have said that, but he doesn't. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. He kind of gives a parameter of his joy, the context in which he is truly rejoicing. It was bound up in his union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those of you who have been with us will know he has given this instruction as an imperative, I might add, in chapter 3, verse 1, when he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. That's a command given to them to rejoice. But it's in the context and with the parameter, with the sphere of being in the Lord. Also, chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. No matter what happens, rejoice in the Lord. This is a command he gives to them, declaring their need to rejoice in the Lord. And here he is saying, I rejoiced in the Lord. I rejoiced. And at that time when we looked at those verses, I, I pointed out, especially there in chapter 4, I pointed out the fact that this is how we rejoice. We rejoice in the Lord. And the problem being, that which steals away our joy or our cause for rejoicing is often our focus. And we look at our problems, we look at our difficulties, we look at our struggles, we look at our lack of money, our, our lack of health, our, our, our lack of things going to plan with regard to our, our family life, our marriage, or whatever it might be. All these things cause us grief and we focus on them. And Paul instructs and says, rejoice in the Lord. Find your joy in those things that are unchangeable. Are your sins forgiven? And can circumstances change it? No, rejoice in that. Have you been adopted as a child of God? Can circumstances change that? No, rejoice in that. Is there a home prepared for you even now in glory? And can anything change that? No, rejoice in that. And all the gospel truths that are unchangeable because they're bound up in the finished work of Jesus Christ, this is our context for joy. It's not because life is going well. It's because when life isn't going well, this doesn't change. I'm in the Lord. I'm in Christ. And so that's even how he interprets good news. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and this is good things that are happening, and the context of joy is within the Lord. This is how he looks at it. So it's not just a perspective to have when bad things occur or things we interpret as being bad, but when good things occur as well, when Paul sees their gift he doesn't go just, well, I rejoice in how good the Macedonians are, how good the Philippians are. No, he rejoices in the law. You know what he sees? I think he looks at the Philippians and he sees the grace of God in their giving. 
The only reason they gave was because of the grace of God that was in them. You take the Philippians outside of Christ, they're not concerned about Paul at all. It is only because they're in the Lord they have any concern for this man who's hundreds of miles away. That is the only reason. Because of the Lord. Because of the gospel. That's the only reason. And that, therefore, is the reason to rejoice. I rejoice in the Lord. It is the grace of God that has supplied this through you. So I am thankful for the Lord and what He has done. The gospel triumphing in your heart leading them to be generous toward him. He saw the love of Christ in their action. No doubt he saw the very love God had for him as a believer in their action. Because there he is in much need and much practical want under house arrest. And he know he has needs, but as this is going to reveal, he is content no matter what he goes through. But, but, he recognized that through the Philippians, there is a vessel that God is showing his love toward him. That God as Father is concerned about his practical needs and welfare. And so he uses the Philippians. He takes people that are miles away in order to come and minister to him. That shows him, I believe, the love of his God. You know, child of God, if you have any need or want, there's no distance, there's no limit to the extent God will go to meet you at the point of your need. If he cannot find someone to meet you where you need to be met and God says that child of mine needs help in that area, needs counsel in that area, there is no limit that God has that he will not go to in order to provide where you need met. And if you have to get help outside of this body, he will find it. If you have to get help from the far-flung corners of the globe, you will get it. I, have, I marvel at the things that God taught me, taking me 10,000 miles away over to Tasmania and Australia and taught me things there that I would not have learned in Northern Ireland. He took me over there to teach me them. And I praise his name for that. He took me from UK right over there in order to teach me things that I could not learn at home. And I praise his name for that. It's him, that, he that gets all the glory. We have, as we looked at in Bible class, a sympathizing high priest. He sees the afflictions of his people and he will meet their need through whatever means necessary. Remember to rejoice, believer, in every good thing as well as in what may be perceived to be bad. And if you're a generous person, remember to rejoice in the supply of grace to your heart. It's only grace that has made you such. Only grace. So let us give the right focus and attention. The sphere of our jo his joy then is declared to be in the Lord. Then thirdly, he declares the sympathy of his joy. The sympathy. Wherein ye were all so careful, but ye lacked opportunity, he says at the end of verse 10. That is to say, you had concern before now, but didn't have the chance to help. Summarize, really, what he is saying there in that latter part. He believed that they had the desire to help. They just didn't have the way of helping, the opportunity to help. And you'll notice from this, this is what struck me, that his thought patterns are not negative in, lack, in light of their lack of giving over the last 10 years or so. <laughs> He's putting verse 8 into practice, we may say thinking of what is true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report. He is thinking positively of them. He was thinking no evil of them, as we're told in 1 Corinthians 13. This is how he perceived them, even in their, what maybe have been looked upon, their negligence. How come it's only hearing from them now? Ten years have passed. Where have you been in other times of trial and struggle? But I, I wish more of us would get this. I wish more of us would get this way of looking at things more positively. Because I hear things and I see things that greatly bother me about how even believers respond to certain scenarios. Let me give some examples. Those people who get a text message or they're in a text message conversation with someone, then they send something and then there's a delay in the response. And they begin to start, to, they begin to interpret the delay. They begin to wonder, have they fallen out with me? Have I said something I shouldn't have said? Or, or, or you know, they begin to like look into the delay and, and, and what is often a very negative light. 
Same with email. Send an email off to someone, and the email initially sent doesn't need a response. But they don't, in not getting a response, they begin to interpret the lack of response as maybe there's a problem here. They're not talking to me. You know, forgetting the fact there was no need to respond, there was no question that required answering. They, 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 you see this all the time. Perhaps you're that type of person. You get anxious about things like this. You get worried. You think negatively. Have they fallen out with me? You're all concerned about things like that. You so easily slip into negative thinking. Well, Paul wasn't like that. He didn't spend 10 years thinking the Philippians didn't like him anymore. He didn't spend 10 years wondering, I wonder did they hear some rumor about me and they're not my friend anymore. Why have they stopped giving? He just got on with the work. And when they finally came back and did help him, he rejoiced in it. He rejoiced. He was thankful for it. And he could see the hand of God in that. And he was able to say, well, you lacked opportunity. You could see the providence of God in it. I'm amazed, as I say, at the thinking patterns of some people. The negativity of their thoughts in regard to scenarios that are similar to this. You know, maybe, maybe you walk out of here and I, I, somehow I'm talking to someone else or I'm elsewhere and I don't shake your hand and you go and you home and you think, has he fallen out with me? Why did he not shake my hand? Look, <laughs> I'll shake hands with my enemy. I have no issues. If I happen to miss you some Lord's Day, there is no offense. There is no reason behind it at all. Or perhaps you think he's ignoring me. Honestly, not conscious of it, not aware of it. If you think I am, come and tell me. We'll sit down and have a cup of tea together and spend a lot of time and talk whatever's on your chest or heart. Look, we can't get negative. And I've heard this. In my time as a believer, I've heard Christians interpreting things. They have no facts. They have no facts about the things at all. They're just letting their minds wander into negativity, which results in bad perceptions of other believers. Like I say, may God fill our hearts with a love that thinks no evil. Thinks no evil. Oh, what a, what a blessing that would be, to have the grace to think no evil. That's the way Paul dealt with this, as he declares his joy in their gift. Secondly, Paul's disclaimer of joy in their gift. He gives a disclaimer in verse 11, where he says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. The Apostle Paul was never downcast about his material state. He had learned to be content in any condition. When Epaphroditus walked through that door of the house that he was living in and was under arrest, he did not find a man mourning, lamenting, and depressed at the fact that he had so little in this life, nor did he find someone questioning the love of God toward him. And that's where the prosperity gospel will lead you, you know. If you get it ingrained in your mind, all this positive thinking and this secret and visualizing things and trying to visualize and how, I was hearing some things about this this week, you know, the, the crazy ends people go to, even to the fact that, you know, if you're overweight, it's not because of what you eat, it's because of how you think. Seriously. This is how far they go. It's not what you're putting into your mouth or your lack of exercise. It's just how you think overweight thoughts, although it was much more crude in the way it was put. And that is what it's the thought. And as soon as you start thinking thin thoughts, then the weight will drop off. I am serious, beloved. This is the extent these things will go to. Prosperity gospel. Trying to visualize prosperity. Trying to name it and claim it. And it's a lie from the pit of hell. Paul declares here that his joy wasn't just in the fact that his material needs were now met. He had learned, as he said, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. He was not in despair. And so he wanted to give a clear disclaimer that his joy was not based on material things. And I want us to be aware of that too. I was talking to our accountant for the church a couple of weeks ago, and he was just encouraged with the giving of the church this year compared to last year, which was also a very good year because of the giving last year. It allowed you even to contemplate a pastor, and then uh, the giving this year again, I, he, he, used, he said it looks like maybe up 50% on last year. Now, that's not the kind of growth you maybe can maintain. That would be uh, maybe putting things a little, you never know, you never know. But thankful to God. 
But I, I don't look at that and say, well, well, isn't that great? Because of, of, of the, just the material worth of it. It is, my mind is working, and if you could see my mind at times, <laughs> the way it works over time, what we can do in this place, what other ways we can reach out. I mean, I have to hem myself in regularly because my mind is racing constantly about, what about this, what about that, what about the other? Constantly working, constantly wondering, how can we get more truth permeating this depraved city? Can we do it through other avenues, other avenues online? Can we do it through other avenues uh, in person, uh, you know, other meetings, uh, uh, an afternoon Sunday service somewhere else in the city at some stage perhaps? Uh, can we do that? Have we the manpower to develop other outreaches and other works? Constantly working. And as I see the increase, I say, thank you, Lord. You will fulfill your purpose. You will fulfill your purpose. And there will be no lack or no want the very fact that he continues to provide is just, again, a seal and encouragement to us all that I'm meant to be here, this work is meant to be open, and God intends it to go forward. And I have no need ever, I don't, I haven't, I will not, push upon you the need for giving. God will finance his will, always, always, constantly, every single time. There is no need, as many give advice now, you read some books about leadership, four times a year you should preach on money. Four times a year should preach on giving. That's what they tell us to do. I don't have to do that because this is God's work. And you're God's people. And this is his gospel. And he will finance his will. On this verse, a commentator noted something quite interesting here in verse 11. He said, the, er the aorist tense of the verb, a learned encompasses all the varied experiences of his, that is Paul's, life described in the next verse. He did not learn this lesson in a day, but throughout a lifetime of ups and downs. The laboratory of his life experience provided continuous opportunities for him to learn the attitude of contentment. His emphatic use of the personal pronoun I highlights his claim that he did his homework, mastered his lessons, and passed his tests. Although the attitude of contentment was not natural, nor did it come easily, this quality of contentment eventually became an essential attribute of his character. And I plead with God, he'd give it to us too. The lack of contentment in today's society is rife. Rife. And not outside the church, inside the church. Inside the church. Lack of contentment. People looking at things, I think you should be doing this. Well, if that's the case, come and tell me what you think I should be doing more of. Come and tell me. Let me know. I am learning and I am willing to learn. And don't just sit there and, and just be critical about it. Come and talk to us about it. And just this lack of contentment, wanting something else, something better, something brighter, something bigger. The way, this is, is that not what we find even with regard to how people treat church as well? They don't know where to settle. They don't know where to worship because they're constantly moving. Oh, this is good. And then they move here. Well, this is good. And then they're constantly moving. They're never happy. Never content. It's, a, it's, a, it's an awful thing to have this lack of contentment, whether it's in material things, spiritual things, relationships. Oh, that person would make a better spouse than mine. The, you know, seriously, watch what you watch on TV. The propaganda of our age, the propaganda is to destroy the family, right? That's it at its heart. And everything you watch is designed to do that. It's designed to make you discontent with God's order. Designed to cause you to question where you are. Question what God has said. It's right in Eden, isn't it? Hath God said that you should stay married to this person till death you depart? Has God said that? You'd be happier if you didn't. Contentment. Apply as necessary. Wherever you are discontent, wherever you find yourself, in everything, I'm not happy with what age I am. <laughs> Young people, don't be like that. I say that to you. Don't wish yourself older. The day will soon come and you could wish you could reverse it. Don't wish you could get out of school. Just apply yourself to what you're doing now and do your best. The time will come and you'll get out soon enough. The same within your work environment. Yes, it may be frustrating. Yes, it may be difficult. But just give yourself to it. Be content. Be content you have a job. Be content that God is supplying your need through that. 
Oh, there's so much that could be said here. Paul gives a disclaimer of his joy and their gift. It wasn't in the material thing. It was a spiritual thing as he goes on to reveal later and we'll see next week. But we need to keep these things in mind and try to replicate the spirit of the apostle here in verse 11. Go over it. Let it sink in. Let its application grip your heart. Thirdly, Paul's discovery of joy in God's gifts. His discovery of joy in God's gifts. So he's received this gift from the Philippians and he is thankful for it, although it's not the gift he rejoices in, but God's mercy, God's goodness, and the fruit that they have borne in their giving. But here he notes in verses 12 and 13 how he discovered joy in what God gives to us. Note first of all the contrast of his experiences. Verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You see the contrast? Abased versus bounding, full versus hungry, abound versus suffer. In the midst of these extremes, Paul demonstrates contentment no matter what. In the extremes, he was content. And he said, he uses the word, I am instructed right there in the middle of verse 12. I am instructed. That is... And the word is very interesting in the sense that it kind of has this idea of being initiated into something. It's like how someone's initiated into a fraternal order or something. It's, it's, except he's been initiated through the experience of suffering or the extremes of what life has to offer. I've been initiated into a mystery, a mystery of how to be content, whether I'm a beast or a bound or full or hungry or a bound and suffering need. The word here, I am instructed, is not found anywhere else. It relates back to verse 11 when he talks about, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. What have you learned? I have learned what I've been instructed in. I've been instructed in how to be full and to be hungry, to abound and suffer need. I've been instructed in that. Paul was taught of God. Through the providence of God, he learned what it was to have and to have not. He learned that. God brought Paul regularly into a classroom, not of mere theory, but of practical experience. Now, he did come into a classroom of theory. There was the start of his ministry when he conversed with the Lord. And I believe when he was out on his own there in Arabia, God, the Lord Jesus, met with him and taught him things that were unique and certainly essential to the future ministry that he would have. But he also had a classroom of practical, not just the theory, but of the practical. And at times everything went well for Paul, but at other times he was made to trudge through destitution and despair. And I know some of you have no financial worries, but you have health worries. And that some of you have no health worries, but you have family worries. And on and on I could go. And each of you are following a path when God is teaching you how to be content. He is instructing you. He is initiating you into the same classroom, the same experience as Paul had to go through. Each of you are following a path when God is showing you what it is to be content. Now the thing is, some of you are looking at your circumstances, I know, because I do the same. <laughs> you look at your circumstances and you say, Lord, if you would just deal with this issue within my home and family. I don't care. You could take away my job. You could take my, my health. You could take away my wealth. I wouldn't care. If you just deal with that one thing. I have no concern about money. I have no concern about those things. But this thing is bothering me. If you just de do that, you can take away the other things. Just deal with that issue. Have you not been there? You have. I know you have. <laughs> if you're human, you've been there. You, you, you analyze a scenario and you say, look, I could deal with that. I just can't deal with this. God, why have you brought this? But I'll tell you why he's brought that and not the other. Because you're right. You're probably right. You probably don't care about material things. You could probably look at it and say goodbye. Doesn't bother me at all. But you're in a classroom to learn contentment. And you're not going to learn that if by nature and by personality and by experience, you can deal with those things easily. You're not learning anything. You're not learning anything. You're sitting in a classroom having already learned everything 
that is being taught. What you need to learn is something new. You need to learn contentment when it's difficult. Otherwise, it's easy to be content, isn't it? The Lord has you in a classroom of struggle, of difficulty, of trial. Your particular thing is designed toward you in your weakness. And that's true. Others may look at your trial and they would say, you know, we bonds, you would say, back in Northern Ireland. Easy. Piece of cake. No problem. But if you had my issue, but the thing is, your issue wouldn't be an issue to the other person. Again, a piece of cake to them. God is tailoring our circumstances providentially. And he is helping you to grow. Some of you have very heavy burdens. You do. I don't deny that. Some of your burdens, I would say that presently I do not have the grace to bear. For if I was going through them, I would lose the plot. But you're going through them. And I can tell you, the fact you're going through them is evidence of the abundance of grace that you are experiencing. Some of you have things in your past and they don't go away either. Those things haunt you every day. You can never get away from them. And yet, it's a thorn. It's teaching you contentment in Him. You can look to the Lord and not despair. You can come to the Lord and not bring a charge against Him. You'll not charge God foolishly. We need to learn this. You see the language of, of the student here? I have learned. I am instructed. This is, this is what we need. <laughs> we need to be learning and instructed in these things. The contrast of his experiences helped him to learn. Then secondly, the claim of his strength. His claim of his strength is given in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Paul dealt with this not through something that was innate in himself. He wasn't a superhuman being. He was of like passions as we are. Don't forget it. He was just a man. He had his worries, he had his concerns, he had his sorrows. Indeed, he had, he had worries and concerns and things got to him in a way that wouldn't get to the average person. When he talks about, and he writes to Corinth, he talks about all the beatings and the stripes and the suffering and being in, in the deep and so on, all this, these, these kind of physical things he experienced. Those are the things we would cave at. Those are the things we'd run a million miles away from. But that wasn't really what caused him discontentment. His struggle for contentment was really in the care for the churches. That's what he said. It's the churches. It's the church. Now, most, most of us don't enter into the love of Christ so much that we feel that way about the church. We're focused on our family and we're focused on our health and we're focused on our you know, jobs and business and so on. You know, the church can go away. There's another church. There's another church. The church can go away. But that wasn't the case for Paul. No, no. Oh, the church, the care of the churches. That's what I wrestle over. Every morning I get up, I have this anxiety for the church. My worries are poured out about the church. I don't care about my enemies. I don't care about the Jews trying to kill me. I don't care about those at Thessalonica who were barbarians trying to take away my life. I don't care. I don't care about the shipwrecking. I don't care about the stoning. I don't care about the scars. I don't care what you think of me. I care about the church. And I weep for the church. My anxiety every day is about the church. And in that, Paul had to learn contentment. He couldn't be everywhere at once. He had to leave the matter to God and pray for the churches. That's how we have to deal with our struggles. We can't change them. You can't change them. You have to leave the matter with God. I plead for grace. This verse 13 is often stretched to impossible application. It does not mean that you can take it and apply it to a person who barely knows basic math and then say, well, you know, you're a Christian now, you'll be able to do that complex equation. Doesn't mean that. And people who try to push it into that kind of application don't understand the text. We are 
encouraged that we can do all things with regard to facing whatever the providence of God brings our way. That's the limit of the all things. Whatever the providence of God brings my way, I can deal with it through Christ who strengthens me. You didn't ask for ill health. You didn't ask for sickness. You didn't ask to have a rebellious family. You didn't ask to have an unconverted spouse. You converted and they didn't. You didn't ask to have the financial troubles. You didn't ask to have, you know, the economic struggles of the present. You didn't ask for those things. That's all come by the providence of God. And the triumph for the Christian is, whatever the providence of God brings, I can do all things. Whatever comes against me in all the variation of trial of life, I can get through all of that by the strength which Christ gives to me, his child. We have a supply of grace that we need to appropriate. And Paul knew how to abound and how to be abased. He knew how to do both. He wasn't like some Christians who feel guilty for being blessed materially. He knew how to be blessed materially, not make an idol out of it. He also knew how to be a beast and not feel that God was punishing him. He could go through all those things by the grace of God, by the grace of Christ, which strengthened him. And would to God we would exhibit the same. That's my desire, you know, through my preaching. It isn't for you to... I don't preach for my benefit. I don't preach just to fill your head with knowledge. I preach so that you deal with life in the most Christ-like way possible. That's it. That's what I'm here to do. You deal with life in the most Christ-like way possible. So when all everything falls apart, the whole bottom falls out of your life, it doesn't fall out of your faith. You still believe. You cling to Christ. You trust him. That's why I preach the way I preach. That's the reason for my preaching to you. As we close, whatever your trial, pray that God would teach you verse 11. Whatsoever state I am. Let's not excuse ourselves. Let's not say I am in a unique case here. Whatsoever state Be content. Contentment in singleness. Contentment in marriage to someone without Christ. Contentment with childlessness. Contentment with troubled children. Contentment with sickness. Contentment with your employment. Contentment in your unemployment. Content in whatever your struggle is. That's not to say you stop praying about what you face. No, you pray. You pray for deliverance. You pray for salvation. You pray for intervention. But you don't charge God in frustration. Be content with his providence. And his providence will bring you to a point where you ought to learn, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. In this season, the grace of God that flows to me from the work of Jesus Christ in Calvary. That's all I need to get through this with joy. Grace only comes through Christ, men and women. So if you're going through a trial, but you're not a Christian, you have no grace. What you need to be is saved. You need to come to Christ. You need to seek him for salvation. And true contentment is only in him. For those of us who are believers, I trust God delivers us from fragility, gives us strength, backbone, contentment through the worst of experiences. Let's bow together in prayer.